So today I wanted to talk about reassembling the content bundle. So if you're 40 years of age or older, you probably grew up with the traditional content bundle, the, the linear content bundle served over your cable provider, right? whether, whether it be Comcast, AT&T, or, or Cablevision, or whomever. And, you know, the bundle started to unravel circa 2010. People started to, to stream content over the internet in lieu of, um, you know, paying the cable fees. And I remember at the time it started with college kids were getting their content from from YouTube and, and wherever else over the internet, OTT over the top is kind of when that phrase was was coined. And the bundle started to unravel. People stopped subscribing to uh, the cable bundle. ESPN started to suffer cancellations. When that started to happen, the bundle really started to unravel because ESPN was the glue that held the traditional cable bundle together. Um, and so yesterday we wrote a piece about A24, the independent movie studio, doing a distribution deal with HBO, which of course, uh, Warner Brothers Discovery is the, the parent company of, of HBO, picker WBD. And, and, and so you're going to start to see the bundle reassemble as a streaming bundle because it's just going to be too difficult for some of these smaller companies to get profitable uh, with their own proprietary streaming network, streaming platform. So as large as Comcast is, I don't know that Peacock will ever get profitable via streaming. I mean, sure, NBC has a fair amount of content, Universal. Um, is it enough content that people care about to want to pay for a premium streaming service at a price that's going to enable Comcast to, to run that, that Peacock Plus premium service at, at a profit? I don't know. Disney with its Disney content, i.e. the legacy animation stuff, Marvel Studios, Lucasfilm, all the stuff they've acquired, they certainly have a large enough content portfolio that is comprised of content that people want to watch to make Disney Plus profitable. The ESPN side of the ledger is a different story for Disney, as we wrote about, as we talked about on the podcast. ESPN doesn't own content. So why are you, why will you subscribe to ESPN in 2023, 2024, as a pure play streaming service, if they don't have a broad content offering, particularly in the price that's kind of being rumored as 30 bucks per subscriber per month, you know, what are they going to serve up for for 30 bucks a month? That's going to want to make you leap at at that opportunity. And you should I'll, I'll link to some of the articles we wrote because there's been some survey work that's been done. To that end, and as the surveys show, there's not a lot of demand for a pure play ESPN service at 30 bucks a month. So they're going to have to figure out the content equation. So I think what's going to happen is you'll have these smaller independent content producers like an A24 that you know aren't even large enough to, to, to build their own proprietary platform, much less operate it and market it. And they'll do distribution deals with large tech companies that are in the space. You know, Amazon's been sort of the the early bird to distribution. I can't remember when they first struck a deal with with Showtime. It had to be seven or eight years ago at least uh, to, to, to stream content as part of the Prime Video platform. So I think you'll see Amazon for sure do that. I think over time, Apple probably will do that, although it's not higher in their priority for Apple TV+. Plus. And there'll be other larger players that that, that could do that. Um, don't discount Microsoft with Xbox. You know, it's, it's a video game first platform, but there's no reason why they can't start to produce feature films in a big way if they chose to do so. Uh, YouTube, obviously, is, is uh, under their new CEO, has been more aggressive 
on the content side uh, that they're still obviously a user generated uh, content platform first, but they've been spending money on proprietary, well, not proprietary content, but let's call it high production quality, third party content, uh, starting with the NFL uh, package. They signed that deal in July and have been running that program since August of this year. Um, who, who can we talk about that's, that's that's kind of interesting? How about Warner Brothers Discovery? So WBD, they've got a content portfolio that I would love to see Apple acquire. I think the uh, high-quality TV shows that they've made in prior years, such as The Sopranos, um, I think the Batman franchise has great history. Uh, th there are certain... Um, uh, certain pieces of content that Warner Brothers has produced over the years that would play well with Apple and fit with Apple's brand of being a, a sort of a high quality brand. And and that's what executives say about Apple and, and Tim Cook as it relates to Apple TV Plus is that they want to produce content that is aligned with Apple's quote unquote quality brand and that they would rather produce less content at a high quality level than just fill the platform with content for no reason other than trying to build up the the, the portfolio. So that they're they're taking curation seriously at Apple. So that's why I think it's going to be uh, it would be unlikely that Apple will start to cut a bunch of distribution deals just for the sake of capturing a, a revenue fee. Um, so, so Warner Brothers, I think in the in the meantime, they'll try to be an acquirer. They've said so publicly. They're uh, cutting expenses, using a portion of that capital to pay down debt, and then assuming rates stay high in 2024 and potentially to 2025. I expect them to come down, but high meaning, let's say north of 2%, perhaps north of 3% in 20, uh, 2024, and then north of 2% in 2025. Uh, there'll be a number of companies that won't be able to survive at that level. And Warner Brothers wants to be a net acquirer. But, but at the end of the day, I, I see them uh, selling themselves. Yeah, you know, I mentioned Apple and Amazon in my note yesterday. I forgot to mention Comcast. That's the one that's been rumored. I don't know. There's a relationship there. Uh, John Malone, the founder of Liberty, which controls uh, Warner Brothers, um, has had a longstanding relationship, probably four decades, if not more, with uh, first with uh, Brian Roberts, founder, the founder of Comcast. And uh, now with Brian, who's been running Comcast for over the last dozen years or so. So there's a natural relationship there. I just don't know if Comcast is going to want to pull the trigger and assume Warner Brothers' debt. They could do a stock deal. Comcast doesn't need to issue debt to get that deal done, but they're going to take more, more debt in the books if they do that deal. So I just I just don't know how, the, how that one will play out. Um, EDR, Endeavor, so they own the WWE and the UFC. I've talked about that one being a good one for Disney to acquire and fold into ESPN because then ESPN would have some content when it becomes a pure play by 2025. Um, EDR, I don't know where they are in, in the immediate term in terms of uh, striking a deal with their private equity owner. Um, I, I forget what the stub position is off the top of my head that, that PE owns but it's a controlling interest. And so, you know, from my point of view, this would be wise to pay a premium and do a deal for, for EDR. It, it's small enough where it's not going to break the bank, but yet the content portfolio is popular enough where it could really move the needle for ESPN. And, and it has the date. The UFC, from my perspective, single-handedly launched ESPN Plus, 
I mean, that's why people subscribe to ESPN Plus is, is the UFC. So they've been in partnership together now. I think we're in year four. They know each other well enough to know whether or not a deal will work culturally and if they can live with each other, which I've heard the relationship is is solid on both sides. Just do that deal, figure it out. But that would be a huge win for ESPN to have uh, UFC, WWE in their portfolio pre-launch as a pure play. And the reason why ESPN struggles, mind you, is, again, they don't have their own content. Uh, why they would struggle to, to, to launch as a pure play uh, streaming network. They don't own their own content, number one. And then number two, they're losing all those broadcast fees. Once they become a pure play and are no longer available over the traditional bundle, they'll, they'll cease to receive those fees from local broadcasters that help make ESPN so profitable. I mean, as I said before, ESPN was the glue that held the traditional bundle together. So if you're going to break up that bundle, that revenue goes away. And, you know, ESPN just as it stands today does not have a lot to offer as a, a standalone streaming platform, given that it's hollow on the content side. Uh, Amazon to me is, is very well positioned with Prime because they've sort of done it all. They've made their own stuff, typically lower budget stuff, in terms of uh, feature-length content as well as uh, TV programming. They've acquired MGM Studios, so that brings in some level of expertise and ought to be able to help raise the production value on both their feature-length content as well as the episodic television content. So they have experience there, and then they have experience on the, the partnership side, bringing in third parties, and taking a fee to make those uh, that, that third-party content available on the Prime Video platform. So commercially, to me, Amazon is the one that's most experienced in the streaming space. They'll figure it out. They're not worried about putting out Oscar-level content like Apple is because Amazon just wants it to be good enough such that the prime video business can act as glue to help keep prime subscribers subscribed. So it's sort of a, a strategic glue that I've written about at length a number of times. Uh, prime video is, uh, is uh, something that helps strengthen the Amazon prime businesses bundle. If you move over to, to YouTube, I think the opportunity there is to continue to acquire the rights to broadcast live sports. Uh, live sports continues to be the content genre, if you will, that captures the most interest, the, the largest audience share. Uh, that was the case in linear television, and that continues to be the case on the, on the streaming side. And then if you think about Apple, as I said, uh, in terms of feature-length film, television for Apple TV+, Plus, they care more about brand, less so about quantity of content produced. I think in the world of content, where Apple probably has more strategic resources allocated in the company, is on the uh, Vision Pro headset side. So thinking about how can we work with third-party content providers to create content that is really optimized for our mixed reality headset, because that's really the opportunity to be a game changer. And to me, Apple needs to create a little bit, little bit of buzz around Vision Pro. And I would love to see them go out and acquire uh, Sphere, the Las Vegas Sphere that's, that's owned by MSG. And you know, use that as an opportunity to promote Vision Pro, use that as an opportunity to experiment with content that's optimized for that format and, uh, you know, cr cross promote. But the promotion's more going one way, it's more going Sphere promoting the, the headset versus the other way around. Sphere is just more sort of a, uh, the Trojan horse to, to get customers to, to, to buy 
And uh, who knows? Maybe someday lease. Although I don't see Apple going that route. Uh, I could be wrong. We'll see. Maybe we'll start to see more leasing of of, of hardware, uh, long-term leases. But in any event, that's my ramble for today. That's all for now. See you next time.